Teaching Rocket Seminar. I, I hope that all of you plan to stay this afternoon. Uh, if you can't stay the whole afternoon, I pray that you'll give me just the first session. But this is for anybody that not only wants to be a better teacher of God's Word, but simply wants to be a better student of God's Word. If, if you've been wanting to become a better student of the Word of God, but felt like you weren't getting any traction, I hope that you'll stay at least for the first session this afternoon because we're going to have a lot of fun together, I, I promise you. But I want you to open your Bibles to Amos chapter 8, the passage that was read just a moment ago. I, I remember when I was growing up, I was in the Boy Scouts of America, and around the time that I was 14, I was inducted into what is known as the Order of the Arrow, the OA as it's called. And uh, the OA is an organization within the Boy Scouts that is committed to preserving the ways of the outdoors. And this is the way that I was inducted into the OA when I was 14. They had us come out to the scout camp there in Meridian, Mississippi on a Friday afternoon late. And we were not allowed to bring anything with us. No gear, no tent, no pack, no nothing, just a sleeping bag. That was the only thing we were allowed to bring was just a sleeping bag, no snacks, no pocket knife, just a sleeping bag. They had us come out to the camp. They didn't feed us any dinner and they waited until it was good and dark and then they took us out into the middle of the woods and about every 200 yards down this trail in the middle of the woods about every 200 yards they would leave one of us to fend for ourselves for the entire night now again remember no no pack no tent no nothing just a sleeping bag so they would go down the trail and they would leave one of us they came to a spot they left me and i remember unfurling my sleeping bag and crawling in and praying to god in heaven that nothing would crawl in there with me and about 2 o'clock in the morning, there come a gully washer of biblical proportions. Can I say gully washer in the Carolinas and y'all know what I'm talking about? There come a gully washer. And about 5 o'clock in the morning, I remember wishing that I had packed my pocket Bible so that I would at least know the dimensions to Noah's Ark because I was about to float away. Finally, the sun come up and it got, it got light outside. They came and collected all of us. They brought us back to the mess hall and they laid our sleeping bags out on the picnic table to dry in the sunlight. They fed us a scrumptious breakfast of a hard boiled egg and half a piece of toast. And then they worked us for three hours. Now, what they had us do is they had us move this, um, this heavy metal office. Do y'all remember that really heavy metal office furniture from the, like the 1970s? Do you know what I'm talking about? They had us move this really heavy metal office furniture by hand. No truck, no nothing. So we're moving this heavy metal office furniture by hand, you know, 14 years old. And it's slippery out sliding. You know, we're sliding all over the place in the mud. We did that for three hours. And then they fed us a scrumptious lunch. What they did is they took crystal burgers and they cut them in quarters. So we got a quarter of a crystal burger, two french fries, and half a glass of punch. And then for the rest of the afternoon, they had us move that aforementioned office furniture back across the camp to its original location. <laughs> Finally, supper time came and they fed us a really a decent meal and I was starving. And thanks be to God, that is the only time in my life that I have ever experienced what real hunger is like. You and I live in a very blessed country in that we probably don't know what hunger and famine are like. If you or a loved one has ever said the words, I'm hungry, it means that it's been a few hours since you last ate and not a few days or even weeks. And yet we can get on our tablets and our phones or our computers or televisions and we can see images of hunger and starvation from other countries on the globe. I, I was reading recently about the nation of Venezuela. In 2001, Venezuela was arguably among South America's wealthiest nations. Now it is certainly the poorest, that because of socialism uh, and economic hardship and, and all of these things, that, that the average Venezuelan has lost 30 pounds over the last several years because of a lack of food, that many times there's food on the shelf and yet no one can afford it, that in one 12-month period, inflation increased eight hundred percent in that country. In fact, just this past week, I read an article about how a, a, a dozen eggs, just a dozen eggs, costs a hundred and fifty-seven dollars U.S. in Venezuela right now. Just a carton of eggs, a hundred and fifty-seven dollars U.S. We live in a blessed country that we really don't know what famine really is, and so I want to talk about a different hunger and a different famine 
that can happen in your life and mine, and that is a hunger and famine for the Word of God. As the prophet Amos said long ago, as God said to him through Amos, he said, "There's a you know the days are coming," declares the Lord, "when I will send a famine on the land, and it will not be a famine of food or a thirst for water, but of hearing the word of the Lord, and people will search from sea to shining sea, north to east, looking for this word. They will not be able to find it." Here is how I have seen this famine develop in people's lives, uh, in, in my experience. You, you take someone that was raised in the church, uh, raised to be with God's people when they meet, raised to love the Lord, to, to love Jesus, to, to love the Bible. For, for many of us who were raised in the church, it is true that somewhere in our late teen, uh, early college years, we began to maybe slip away or backslide a little bit from church activities. We, we got busy. Uh, so, and this is very much me. I, I am, I'm a preacher's kid, and as a result, I am the proverbial drug baby. I was drugged to Bible class and drugged to church and drugged to Christian camp and drugged to a Christian university and all those other things. And so you take someone like me, raised in the church, raised by godly parents, late teen, early college years, no matter where we go to college, whether it's a secular school or a Christian university, there is that temptation to, to slide away a little bit. I remember being a student at Fried Hardeman. And, and one of the things you need to know about this story is that in West Tennessee and, and several other places, but in that area of Tennessee, there are several communities with the last name Springs in the name of the town. There's a Bethel Springs and a Essary Springs and several other Springs communities in that area. So when I got to be a freshman at Fried Hardeman, I remember hearing many of my classmates talk about their attending the Box Springs Church of Christ on Sunday morning. And I remember thinking, I don't know where Box Springs is located. I know where Bethel Springs is, but I haven't heard of Box Springs. I was a junior before I realized they were talking about their mattress and they were sleeping in on Sunday morning, going to the Box Springs Church of Christ. And so, you know, certainly in our college years, we, we sometimes talk ourselves out of being involved in church as, as much as, as possible. I remember, you know, sometimes really struggling to to get myself out of bed and go to church like I should on Sunday morning. I remember what it was like to, to be there on Sunday night at some of the churches near Fried Hardeman. And, and uh, you know, after services on Sunday night, they would say, you know, we've got the Lord's Supper prepared for uh, those of you that would like to partake. And as they're singing that last song, there's all these college students who were mysteriously providentially hindered that morning from being at services. I know, I remember what that was like. I remember it was, it was a temptation for me. And, and I think what we tell ourselves in that stage of life is, I'll wait until I'm older. I'll wait until I've graduated. I'll wait until I'm married, settle down, have a family. I'll wait until I have kids. I'll go to Bible class a little bit more regularly when I get to that point. I, I was raised in Sunday school. I'm going to want my children to be raised in Sunday school. So I'll, I'll be more faithful when I'm a little bit older. That's what we tell ourselves. But then the kids come. And I mean, it is really hard to get to Bible class on time when you have small children in the house. Do any of you have small children in the house right now? Raise your hands. Anybody? I mean, it is exhausting. It is exhausting to go anywhere with small children, but especially on Sunday morning. It is so exhausting to get to church with little kids because you have to wake them up and you have to feed them, and you have to give them a bath, and you have to get them dressed, and you have to pack the diaper bag, and then there is a blowout right before you walk out the door, and you have to get them in their car seat. Folks, I am telling you, it is exhausting watching my wife do all that work. <laughs> and so... You say, well, I'll wait until they're teenagers. You know, I grew up in youth group. I'm going to want them to be in youth group. Have you seen teenagers' schedules today? I mean, there's ball and band and practice and all these things. Here's my point. Here's my point. If you and I are not careful, we can go decades, decades without ever being a part of a meaningful group of people intent on studying the Word of God. And one day we wake up and realize that much of our life has passed by and we have not been investing ourselves in a relationship with our Heavenly Father by studying His Word. And then one day we discover there is a famine in our land and we search from sea to shining sea looking for a word from the Lord. There's none to be had because we have not been seeking it with our whole heart. I want to talk just a moment uh, this morning to those of you that are here 
that for whatever reason you do not regularly attend a Bible class in this congregation. I'm not going to ask you to stand. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand. I have no interest in humiliating or embarrassing you in any way. But if you're here this morning and that describes you that just for whatever reason you can't seem to get here for Bible class on a regular basis, I'd like to talk to you for, for just a few moments. I would like for you to consider taking up a challenge that I'm going to give you. I would like for you to consider giving me the next four Sundays. I would like for you to choose a Bible class in this congregation and make the commitment that you will be there every week for the next four weeks. I am not asking for the rest of your life. That would not be fair of me. I just want you to give me the next four Sundays. Choose a Bible class, make the commitment to be here every week for the next four weeks. And after those four weeks are over, I want you to ask the question, am I better off now spiritually than I was four weeks ago? I think that you'll be amazed at the response. Because what I have discovered in my life is that every week in Bible class, God gives us three things that all of us need in our Christian walk, and he gives them to us in Bible class every week. Number one, every week in Bible class, God gives us a model for life. I remember when I was growing up, my daddy was a preacher, and as a result, he would read bedtime stories to me as a little boy as I was going to sleep. And sometimes they were uh, stories from his childhood. Uh, other times they were stories about Tom Landry's Dallas Cowboys or uh, things related to Superman. But most often, my daddy would tell me stories from the Bible. It was from him that I first learned about the great heroes and heroines of faith, stories about Abraham and Moses and Elijah and Peter and Paul and Daniel and his three friends. Shadrach, Meshach, and as my dad used to call him, under the bed we go. I remember hearing the stories of these great heroes and heroines of faith from my dad, but also learning these stories in Sunday school as a little boy. And then as a young adult, going back and rediscovering the lives of these individuals and having this interesting realization that when I was a kid, I used to approach them almost like you would a star athlete with awe and reverence and a please, sir, can I have your autograph? But then when I rediscovered their lives as an adult, I discovered they're not that different from me. They had profound failures of faith, that they struggled in their relationship with God. And so rediscovering their lives as an adult, it, it gave me hope that man, if there's hope for them, there's certainly hope for me. Every week in Bible class, you and I get to examine a model for life to, to recognize that there are parallels in our life to those in Abraham and Moses and David and Jeremiah and Elijah and, and all the others, we, we have a better understanding of what God wants to do in our lives, how he wants us to live and how he wants us to serve him. Every week in Bible class, we are given a model for life. Number two, every week in class, God provides a message for life. I don't know if you've ever thought about the story of Naaman, the Syrian army commander in 2 Kings 5, who is uh, stricken with leprosy, and he is told that if he will go to Israel to search out the prophet, the man of God known as Elisha, Elisha tells him to dip in the Jordan River seven times, and if he does, he will be cleansed of his leprosy. Naaman does so, and he is cleansed. I don't know if you've ever noticed in that story, but how many times does God speak to Naaman directly in that story? Do you remember how many times does God speak to Naaman directly in that story? It's zero. He never does. But God does speak to Naaman through a slave girl, through a prophet's servant, through the prophet himself, through Naaman's own servants. He never speaks to Naaman directly. That tells me something. It tells me that God speaks to his people even today in the context of community. Here's how it works. I don't believe that God speaks in an audible voice. I don't believe that God reveals additional revelation or speaks in a way that contradicts his own word. But have you ever been to church on a Sunday and something was said in the sermon or maybe a line in one of the prayers? Maybe it was a line in one of the songs that you had sung a hundred times in your life before, but something was said and you walked out these doors saying to yourself, I really needed to hear that today. Has that ever happened to any of you? Ever happened to any of you? What is that? God is speaking to us in the context of community. And, and let me just tell you, when you shut yourself off from the church, and especially when you shut yourself off from Bible class, you are dramatically limiting God's ability to speak a word into your life. Every week in Bible class, we receive a message for life. But number three, most importantly, and the lesson will be yours, 
Every week in class, not only do we receive a model for life and a message for life, but we receive a master for life. My daddy was a gospel preacher. My mama's a godly woman. And as a result, I do not remember the first time in my life that I heard the story of Jesus. Because my parents were such godly people, I know that I had to have only been a few days or weeks old when I first heard the story of Jesus. But my earliest memory of hearing the story of Jesus comes from being in a cinder block classroom in a church building in Morton, Mississippi. And back then, Jesus was on a flannel board. Kids, ask your parents what a flannel board was. (laughs) Jesus was on a flannel board. And I remember stories of Jesus loving the little children, of Jesus healing the sick and, and raising the dead, of Jesus going to the cross and dying for my sins so that I would have the hope of eternal life. And let me tell you something. Every week since my childhood, I have had the distinct privilege of falling back in love with Jesus over and over and over again in Bible class to be reminded of the master of my life, of he who has loved me since before the foundations of the world. I don't know that it would be possible for us to do this this morning, but I want you to imagine that it was somehow possible for you and I individually, every single one of you, It was possible for you and I to sit down and for me to hear your life's story and for me to tell you mine. I don't know, again, I don't know if that's really possible from a logistics standpoint, but just imagine that I was able to sit down with every single one of you and you told me your life story and I told you mine. As you heard my life story, one of the things that you would quickly figure out is that people have given me over the years, people have given me a lot of reasons to leave the church. And I would imagine that for some of you, you could tell a similar story. That in your past, there is some spiritual or emotional abuse. There is some mistreatment that someone sinned against you or wronged you, or perhaps it's been a long series of people that have hurt you and insulted you, people that claim to be Christians, people that claim to love the Lord, people that went to church on a regular basis, and they hurt you in some way very deeply. And even now, it's a struggle to go to church on a regular basis because it just hurts so much. I need to tell you that that is my life's story that people have given me a lot of reasons to just walk away from the church forever. But can I tell y'all a little secret this morning? Can I let y'all in on a little secret? Some of you are like, what's he about to say? (laughs) People have given me a lot of reasons to leave the church, but Jesus keeps giving me more reasons to stay. And every week in Bible class, I'm reminded of Christ's immense love for me I'm reminded of the master of my life. And if you are here this morning and you do not already attend a Bible class regularly in this congregation, I'm begging you, just give me the next four weeks. I'm not going to ask for the rest of your life. I don't think that would be reasonable at this point. Just give me the next four weeks. Choose a Bible class and commit to being in it every week for the next four weeks. And after those four weeks are over, ask yourself the question, Am I better off now than I was four weeks ago, spiritually speaking? I think you'll be amazed at the response because every week in class, God provides not only a model for life and a message for life, but most importantly, a master for life. Maybe you're here this morning and you're not a Christian. The Bible says if you'll put your faith in Jesus Christ, turn from your sins and be buried with him in the waters of baptism, you can leave here as an heir of eternal life. For many more of you, maybe you're here and you are a Christian and yet you know there are some changes that you need to make before it is eternally too late. If you have a need to respond publicly for any reason this morning, we want you to come as together we stand and sing to encourage you.